Now it's time to go through the morning's newspapers with you. And uh, here with me to help review them are the UK editor of The Big Issue, Paul McNamee, and the editor-in-chief of National World Cities, Nancy Fielder. So a very good morning to both of you. Lovely to have you on this morning. Um, lots around, lots of different front pages, actually, on the papers um, this morning. Nancy, uh, you picked out the Daily Telegraph's front page story, and a number of the other papers, the tabloids in particular, have picked up on this. And it's an interview with Nicola Bully's husband, Husband. Um, and this I know of real interest to you. It's very much in your area, isn't it, that you cover? Absolutely. Um, so we look after the Lancashire Union Post in Preston, the Blackpool Gazette, and interest is enormous, unlike you see in a local story like this, including people flocking to the scene. But, I mean, the new angle here is um, Nicola's partner saying he doesn't believe what the, peop what the police have said for quite a few days now that she went into the river and he's pleading with them to expand their search to do more searches of outbuildings of properties he's convinced something else has happened to her and obviously is absolutely desperate to get her home it's just such a tragic story it's captured everybody's imaginations but it has really shook um the city of preston it, it shook the little villages and the little towns around it because there's just no clues there's no explanation um, and as time passes it feels a little bit like hope is fading, but her family and her friends and her clearly her partner want to keep this in the headlines because they know without that, the chance of her coming back gets even smaller every day. That's right. And they very much are keeping it in the headlines, aren't they? And this interview was um, his interview with Channel 5 News, uh, as, as we say, splashed across the papers. And, um, yeah, one hopes for their sake that they do get some news and some developments on on the search. Um, in the meantime, um, the Times, Paul, um, has a very different story. They do have a picture, actually, of Nicola Bully and her partner there on the front page with the, with the same um, headline there. But their main story focuses on possible proposals uh, to, um, to, to reform the benefit system in some ways. We've heard a little bit in the last few weeks about some of the perks that might be offered to people if, to encourage them back to work. This seems to be a bit more of the, 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 the stick approach. Yeah, this is very much the stick and it does feel very uh, old school in approach. The idea in essence is that people who are long-term um, unemployment, who are in universal credit, will be told they have to go for a two-week intensive training programme at their local job centre or face censure or face losing their uh, benefits for up to three months. So they'll be totally destitute. Um, there's four pilot areas at the moment or that they're looking to. One, West London, Pontefract, West Yorkshire, Partick, not far from here in, in Glasgow, and Colville in Leicester. And the problem here, I think, is that it, it feels as though it, it's yet again punishing those who are at the bottom. Rishi Sunak has pledged to cut um, numbers of people on, on um, unemployment benefit and to get people into work. And while it's obviously a laudable idea to reform training and, and improve training, this just looks like a way of moving people off the books, of saying, right, we can, we can put a line through it. If you're not receiving benefit for three months, that means you're not, essentially, uh, job seeking, therefore they can bring those figures down. It doesn't look like it's long term practical solution to long term joblessness or indeed to fix the training system that needs reform. It just is a, a paper exercise to appease some people and to look at the next election. Okay, that's interesting because definitely the, the government is saying, aren't they, that their, their real focus is trying to encourage uh, people to go back into work. There are a number of people, particularly over 50s, weren't there, that, that left the workforce um, after the pandemic. And uh, the government obviously sees it key to get them back into work to, to boost growth. Interesting your take, though, on, on those particular plans. Um, let's take a look at The Guardian next, shall we, Nancy? And this is, um, they claim it as an exclusive. They say that um, the Tories are now uh, plotting, they say, um, a childcare giveaway in the budget. So what details have they got here? So they're looking here um, at the youngest children. So there are already sort of childcare um, free places for three-year-olds. What they want to do is bring it a lot younger, um, possibly as young as nine months. Um, one and two-year-olds would also get free childcare. And Labour are obviously promising a huge shake of childcare, but we have a crippling cost of being a mom or dad and trying to work in this country when you've got small children. It literally puts people off. I know people who it stops working certain 
hours because if you work too long, you don't get the benefits and it's just not worth going to work. So this is a massively, massively important issue. I think it is absolutely right that it looks to extend to younger children. I think it should also extend to wraparound care when children are at school. We've got to find some ways of supporting people who want to work. And it can't be that people are put off either work or having children because it's too expensive. It's not the same in other countries and it's about time. I'm, I'm hoping there is a big fight over this one between the Conservatives and Labour. Somebody gets it right because working parents really need help here. Yeah, and it does sound like a part of the same drive to get people working, doesn't it, Nancy? And um, the Treasury has asked the Department for Education to, to submit various options. So it'll be interesting to see what they do go with because we're told that there's not much money around to spend in the budget, isn't there? So whether or not they will commit to that or not, we don't know. Uh, 15 of March, the budget, and that's when we'll find out. Um, in the meantime, uh, the Eye, Paul, um, the Eye has done a series of these front pages actually this week, hasn't it? Focusing on water companies and uh, worries about the health of our rivers. Talk us through this one. Yeah, this is, this is the, um, the launch of a campaign that the Eye have to save our rivers. Um, they And they detail the terrible state the rivers across the UK are in, and some of the these, the statistics are, are terrifying. They say that uh, uh, only 14% of England's rivers are classified as good. Only 14. It, the numbers vary. It's 40% in Wales, 40 and sorry, 45 in Wales, 40 in Scotland. None in Northern Ireland, shamefully. Um, and they think if it keeps going at the current rate with all the stuff that's being poured in, all the farming pollution, all the sewage. By 2027, only 6% of UK rivers will be in a good state, which obviously has massive implications for how we live and, and how we interact with the natural world and how that comes back to us. So they've launched a campaign, Fergal Sharkey, former undertones from man, is at the forefront of this. He has become something of a campaigner for clean water and clean rivers across Britain. Uh, he is calling on uh, company directors of particular water companies to be personally liable if they are polluting rivers, which is a, a massive change in legislation. I think that'd be pretty tricky to implement, but it's interesting that that is where the, the direction of travel is, to try and make people responsible for the things that are happening. And there are other organisations involved, the Anglers Trust, Angling Trust and so on. So this is, you know, as you said, it's, it's something that I have been looking at, but others as well. And it's been an incredibly hot topic, considering it's not just rivers and it's our coasts as well that yeah. have been terribly polluted. And, and something a lot of people feel very passionately about, don't they? Um, so interesting to see if they get anywhere with that push. Um, OK, and um, Nancy, a story on the front page of the Financial Times here about um, telling skyscrapers to dim their lights a bit. As every parent in every house has been telling their teenagers to do, not only is it better for the environment, not to waste electricity, but it saves money. You would have thought they wouldn't need legislation around this, but they do. They want on to obviously keep the lights that are there for safety and security and to allow people to work if people are working through the night or international hours. But let's not just burn power for the sake of it, so they want external lights, any unneeded lighting turned off. Now, there's a good play on the bright lights, big city here, but this is a really important issue. Um, I don't think it will drastically bring misery to anybody. And quite frankly, I think the company should have had the intelligence to have done it in the first place. But the legislation is on its way, by the looks of it. It does make sense, doesn't it? Um, and um, I don't think we've got time, actually, Paul, to do this last story about a space odyssey to Jupiter. But um, we can direct people to the front page of the FT for, for that. Um, sounds fascinating. Quite tempted to go myself, actually. Um, but Paul and Nancy, always good to have your views. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Do stay with us. Coming up in the next hour, Kay Burley will be live from Karaman Marash as the number of people confirmed to have died in Turkey and in Syria rises to more than 24,000. She'll have all the latest live at 7.